I would like to begin by sharing with you who my hero and inspiration is. I love Marvel comics, but it is not one of those superheroes. I absolutely love Star Wars, but it is not Luke Skywalker, and it is most definitely, God forbid, not Darth Vader. I have lots of heroes. Some of them are not bigger than the size of your iPhone 6 Plus. And these are the tiny premature babies that I take care of as a neonatologist, a newborn and premature baby specialist. Do you know what is very cool about a newborn baby? They may be in incubators. They may have four or five IVs running through them, maybe even a breathing tube, but when they turn five or six weeks, they start smiling. A big, beautiful smile lights up their face. Unlike adults, babies cannot fake a smile. I feel that they are able to do it because they have mastered the art of being in the moment, of having present moment awareness. Imagine if this little baby let the past come into the present thinking, oh my God, I'm premature. I'm not even supposed to be alive. It would be in deep trouble very soon. And I feel that we can learn this from our little babies, mastering the moments, mastering the art of present moment awareness and not letting our past come into our present. I feel that this can be achieved through the process of love, kindness, and compassion. Loving kindness and compassion always needs to begin with self-love and self-compassion. And I feel that the path through this is through the method of meditation. One of the greatest role models in my life is my dad. He is an atomic scientist, and he has always been of the firm belief that nuclear science should be used for peaceful purposes, such as using the atom to create electricity in villages for the poor people and not to make bombs and to take lives. He introduced the practice of meditation to the scientific community in India many decades ago, and he was able to prove that within a year of the regular practice of meditation, conflict came down 80% and productivity went up 60%. My mom is a mathematician, but she is also very much a mother, and she worries a lot about me. Just the other day, she called me up at 10 p.m. from India, making sure that I'd had my dinner on time. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to go to the Himalayas over 20 times and have been lucky enough to be up on Mount Everest four times. What is really cool when you're going up on the mountains is when you cross 20,000 feet, the clouds come under you. So when you are watching the sky, you're watching the clouds, you are looking down, not up. It's like a Salvador Dali painting, immensely surreal and absolutely beautiful. A few years ago, I isolated myself in a cave in the Himalayas for 10 days in total darkness in meditation. If we feel that people are scary, some of the scariest things on earth are your own thoughts when they come up from the deepest recesses of your mind. And you cannot even reject them. They are a part of you. But what is very cool is that when there is understanding and acceptance of yourself as a person, this is when the conditioning melts away and the courage starts to rise up. As if this wasn't enough, the next year I went to live under a tree in the Himalayas. No tent, no sleeping bag, just living between the roots of the tree, totally dependent on nature for my survival. There was this wild mountain dog who came down from the high altitude. He probably even hadn't seen a human being for many years, and he would watch me meditating, and the second day onwards, he started meditating next to me. He got me dead rats and mice in order to share his lunch with me, which I politely refused. What was interesting was that the first couple nights, he saw me sleeping with no sleeping bag, with my head on the hard floor. The third night, I felt a nudge under my head, 
and he was actually offering his back as a pillow to me while sleeping. This was a great revelation to me that love, kindness, and compassion are not only restricted to human beings, they also overflow into the animal kingdom. There was an interesting incident a few years ago which drove home to me the power of meditation. I was doing this remote trek on a glacier in the Himalayas, walking on this glacier for two weeks, sub-zero freezing temperatures with six layers of clothes on me. And then I see this group of monks just chanting, dancing, laughing, walking on this glacier, no clothes except for a loincloth, no shoes, no sandals, no slippers, barefoot, walking on this ice for two weeks. This didn't make sense to me. As a medical doctor, I'm looking and saying, hey, Maybe they have frostbite. Maybe they have gangrene of the feet. And this is what is preventing them from feeling the cold glacier. So I stopped them. And I said, please, sir, can I examine your feet? And they were very cool dudes. They said, absolutely no problem. <laughs> and the feet were entirely OK. This was the first time that it was brought home to me that maybe meditation can play a very major role in maintaining human health. This inspired me to start a research project in the Himalayas. The purpose of this project is to be able to find which people, the hikers, trekkers, and mountaineers climbing or even hiking up at high altitude might get mountain sickness. Mountain sickness results as a result of lack of acclimatization, adaptation of the body to the high altitude and the low oxygen. It can be very mild, such as just a bit of dizziness or giddiness, but it can take potentially fatal forms, such as high altitude cerebral edema, the brain filling up with fluid, and high altitude pulmonary edema, the lungs filling up with fluid. What we are doing is preparing a physiologic graph of the people as they are going up on the mountain by measuring basic physiologic parameters, such as heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturations, and other physiologic criteria, and build a graph, and to see which person is beginning to slip off the graph, and therefore might have a higher tendency of falling sick. This is a very cool project, and also involves taking these little ultrasound machines with us into the high mountains, and checking ultrasounds of the various organs of the body to check their acclimatization. We are also doing neurocognitive function studies. An, inspect, an interesting aspect of this research is we are beginning to look at the effect of pranayam, which is yoga breathing, and meditation at high altitude to see if they prevent mountain sickness. And the results are actually quite encouraging, telling us that meditation may play a major role in preventing sickness in the human body. This project is one of the first of its kinds in the world and has the potential to save human lives. And I have been lucky enough to present it at a couple of conferences. Now let me take you away from the Himalayas and into Brooklyn, New York. A lot of the teaching for my medical students occurs under the trees in Prospect Park, a park situated close to my hospital. The first 10 minutes is music. I love to play Indian classical music on the flute. And this is followed by didactic teaching. I really believe that in the presence of nature, your conditioning melts away and your mind becomes open to creativity. What is also very nice is that there are very happy people walking about in Prospect Park on a nice sunny afternoon. And there was this time a year ago when the music session was going on that one by one people came and started putting money in front of us. <laughs> And at the end of the teaching session, we ended up with $110, <laughs> which we gave to charity when the session was done. I've also begun to introduce the practice of mindfulness meditation to the medical students and the doctors at the hospital. There is very strong evidence that meditation makes you better equipped to face stress and even a better interview giver and a very good exam taker. The reason for that is that the part of the brain which covers the stress responses, the fight or flight response, it's called the amygdala. It entirely takes over in moments of stress and suppresses 
rational thinking of the front, the prefrontal cortex. This phenomenon is called the amygdala hijack, and this can be prevented by the process of meditation. I also volunteer as an art guide at the Rubin Museum of Himalayan Art in Chelsea, Manhattan. And a part of the pediatric rotation of the medical students is to come and have an art tour with me at the museum where we explore, where art and science talk to each other through the medium of metaphors and the medium of beauty. This is so much of a reminder to us that medicine is as much an art as it is a science. We began by talking of love, kindness, compassion, of what practical use is this in everyday life? What role does it play in day-to-day -day living? I would like to share a story with you. Little baby Naomi was born at 28 weeks of pregnancy. She was born by emergency caesarean section because the placenta had already started separating from the uterus. And every second that little Naomi was in her mother's womb, she was being deprived of oxygen. When she was born, she had no heart rate. She wasn't breathing. And we were doing major resuscitation in order to get her heart started, doing chest compressions, getting a breathing tube in, giving medications to start the heart. At the same time, Naomi's mother's heart also stopped beating. She lost such a lot of blood that she had gone into shock. Here we were doing chest compressions on this little baby, trying to get her back to life. And there on the other table, they were doing chest compressions on Naomi's mother. Slowly, this little baby's condition became a little bit more stable. And we took her to the newborn intensive care unit, still very, very sick. Naomi's father came to meet me in the neonatal ICU. He told me, Dr. Ron, what's happening? One hour ago, my world was absolutely perfect. Right now, everything is collapsing and falling apart. The two people that I love most in the world, I am losing both of them. What can I do? I assured him that we would try our very best to save their lives. And I told him from his, his side, all he needed to do was to just envelop them in his love, his kindness, his compassion. Just be there for them and just take each day as it comes and we would see how it goes. Every one of his waking hours, this father was in the newborn intensive care unit, holding on to his little baby, caressing her, speaking to her. And the rest of the time, he was in the adult intensive care unit where his wife was critically sick with a breathing tube in her, holding her hands and speaking with her. Slowly, Naomi's mother's condition started turning the corner for the better. That, he came, that she came off the breathing tube. I still remember that day very vividly because one hour after this mother's breathing tube came out, she was up in the neonatal intensive care unit holding on to her little baby, speaking to her, fondling her, cuddling her, and just loving her. Every one of her waking hours, this mother spent next to her little daughter, just giving her all her love, giving her all her affection, all her compassion. Little Naomi's condition also started turning the corner for the better. The day came that she came off the breathing tube. And eventually, a few weeks later, she got discharged from the hospital. We lost touch. Eight years passed. And a few weeks ago, when I was doing rounds in the intensive care unit, one of my nurses came running to me. And she said, Dr. Ron, there is somebody to meet you at the door. I went out. And there was this eight-year-old girl. She saw me, and she jumped right into my arms. She was so tall that I nearly toppled over. <laughs> she looked at me, and she said, my name is Mayomi. My mommy says that you are the doctor that saved my life. Thank you so much for doing that. She gave me a beautiful, beautiful smile and a bright, warm hug. Naomi's mother told me that despite her heart having stopped for a couple of minutes, Naomi was still doing very well at school, 
that she had a near perfect report card. And just the other day, her teacher had told her that your daughter has great leadership skills, which probably meant that she was being very bossy in the classroom. <laughs> so we spoke for about 20 minutes, and then they left. And then I went into the bathroom and cried, utterly overwhelmed and humbled by the power of love, by the power of compassion. This inspired us to join a program called the Baby Cuddler Program at the hospital. We have these volunteer cuddlers come in and cuddle these little babies, play with these little premature babies, and give them the human touch. And there is very strong evidence that the babies which are cuddled, the ones which get the human touch, they do much better. They have far fewer complications. They go home much sooner. And there is great research which has been done even following them into their teenage, which shows us that they are far better balanced as teenagers than the non-cuddled little ones. Such is the power of love and such is the power of compassion. What's my take home message? I would say that these are very trying times. There is so much happening out there, so much of stress, so much of what we are reading and experiencing, that it is very easy to lose our love. It's very easy to lose our kindness. And there really is no reason to do that. I firmly believe that the energy and the power of love is still immeasurable and absolutely immense. Science is important, of course. Technology is important. We would not be where we are today without the presence of science and without the presence of technology. But I would also say, never underestimate the power of love. I really firmly believe that among other things, all you need is love. Thank you so much.